Okay. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm still working on the exam. Uh, between that and my structures exam that I've got uh, grading simultaneously. Um, fortunately, most of my advising load has sort of calmed down a little bit, so tomorrow should be a pretty open day for me, and I'm hoping to just sort of knock it out, because short answer is i got to get it done, because at some point we're going to have another exam, so I better get it out of the way. Yeah. I, what's that? Yeah. I got the, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence, sir. Well, the thing is, it's easier in Blackboard to enter zero than it is one zero zero. So, if you're concerned about my well-being, I could just do that. But uh, then why can't I just do that with zero? It's less keystrokes. You, you should consider civil engineering like geotech because you're digging the hole. It's just getting deeper and deeper. Oh, my jokes are really bad and cheesy. I'm, I'm well aware of it. It's okay. I could just wait for my uh, my course evals, you know, and everybody's talking about all the bad jokes that I tell, and the, you know, it's like we're getting si sick and tired of these math puns. He needs to derive some new ones. Okay, thank you. Somebody got it. Okay, <laughs> I'm a dork. I know it's okay. All right, today we're beginning a new topic in the course, and the topic is structural analysis. Um, to be crystal clear. Not everybody in here is going to be a civil engineer. I mean, there, there is a course in civil engineering devoted specifically to structural analysis because it's what we do, um, or one of, one of our, our sub-disciplines. But even if you're a mechanical engineer or biomedical engineer, it doesn't really matter. Um, there is going to be a component of your field where what you need to do is, given some external forces on a system, you need to determine the internal response inside that system to maintain equilibrium. And the reason why is for the purposes of design. Um, just as a basic example, you know, here, here's this table, and here I am sitting on this table. And I've mentioned this before, but if somebody comes in with the secret weapon of engineering, a samurai sword, or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, and cuts through the table, I'm going to fall on the floor, right? The reason why is because the table inside right here is supporting a series of internal responses, internal forces, internal moments, etc. And the idea is to determine those internal forces required to keep the structure in equilibrium such that what we can then do is look at design. What materials do we need to build this table out of? How uh, thick does the board need to be so that it can safely support a given load. And I don't care if you're a civil engineer, mechanical engineer, biomedical engineer, there are applications in all of those fields where that is an important task. Now, what our goal in this class is, is to handle some classical structural analysis problems that engineers face, and we have two of them that we're going to look at uh, uh, in this course, one being trusses and one being beams, um, and, and what we're going to do is see if we can determine and classify those internal responses. And so we're going to start with trusses. You may never build a truss in your life, but the analytical tools that we develop are going to be essential as you move forward throughout your career. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about trusses, though, because that's what we're going to be um, uh, looking at for the next couple of lectures. Um, you've probably seen trusses before. Um, you know, we, we have roof trusses, we have bridges, uh, etc. Um, if you want a textbook definition for what a truss is, it's basically an arrangement of straight members. Usually, we take those members and arrange them in triangular patterns to form some structure or some component of a structure. Um, we use them in roofs, we use them in bridges, you name it. Okay, go to Walmart, look up. All, nothing but trusses. Um, the, the, without getting too far into structures land, to go back to, to this, there are some advantages and disadvantages of using trusses. This part might be a little bit more for the civil engineers in the room. But just to give you an idea, like if we take a look at this bridge, um, 
One of the advantages of using a truss is that it is lightweight and it is very stiff. They, they have a, a very strong or a very high um, uh, sort of stiffness to weight ratio. They can hold up a lot of load uh, for being very light. The downside of a truss is that it's expensive. Um, there's a lot of members, a lot of cutting, a lot of drilling, a lot of welding, a lot of uh, uh, fabrication necessary to, to, uh, um, to, to erect and, and fabricate uh, a given truss, and time equals money. Um, so it is just one of a number of uh, tools available at your disposal to uh, span a, a, a given you know, river or whatnot. And, and whether or not we're talking about bridges or, or roofs or even other systems that that have truss type components, it is one of a, a number of tools at your disposal. Now, when we analyze trusses, we make the following three assumptions. Okay, um, These assumptions are bore out not just by some of the fabrication practices that we utilize when we uh, fabricate trusses, but also in real life. I mean, I have actually gone in, in my, uh, my research program, I have actually gone out to real world trusses, tested them, collected that data and compared it to the tools that I'm literally going to show you right now uh, and you'll find that the, the answers match, you know, like exactly, very, very, very well. Um, so, so this is borne out not just by the real world but by some of our practices. What do I mean by that? Okay, so we make the following three assumptions. So the first assumption is that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints and so all that assumption basically means is that when we sum forces in some moments and perform our static analysis, that there aren't any additional in unintended forces that we need to deal with. Like there's no friction or any, anything else. Like what's on the system is what's in the system. Um, the second is that all of the loads and support reactions are applied only at the joints. And the third is that at, it, at each joint, the centroids of each member coincide. Now you know what I'm talking about when we talk about centroids. Okay. Now these two assumptions here kind of all mean a, a, a particular thing. Okay. So here's a truss joint in real life. And what you can sort of see is, okay, I've got this top member here, this top member here, this diagonal, this diagonal over here, this vertical member. And I've got all these members all meeting at a common point. And all of the centroids, the, set, the, the axis where the centroid is along each of these members, all meet at a common point. We'll say maybe like right there. So what that means is, if all the loads are applied at the joint and all the centroids go through that common joint, what we're dealing with is a particle statics problem. We're dealing with a concurrent force system, right? Remember, the very first topic that we did in this class was statics of particles, problems where all the forces all met at a common point, okay? I propose that every truss joint that we are going to analyze in this course is going to be a concurrent force system. All the forces are going to meet at a common point. And if all of the forces meet at a common point, what do we not have at that joint? We don't have moments. Okay? That was the whole point of defining the moment. The moment was how we resolve static equilibrium when the forces don't meet at a common point. Does that make sense? So it's all sort of coming together a little bit. Now we have two methods for analyzing a truss. The first method is what we're going to utilize today. It's what's called the method of joints. The method of joints is basically taking a given truss and investigating the equilibrium of each joint one by one. So, for example, if here's a truss, you know, we'll look at each joint by the time that we're all done with it. We'll look at joint A, we'll look at joint B, look at joint C, look at joint D, look at each one of them and figure out what are the internal forces inside those members required to keep the structure in equilibrium. When it's all said and done, we will know the internal force inside every member in the truss. That's what, whenever you hear somebody say we're solving a truss, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about determining the internal forces inside all of those members. Now the method of joints is tedious. I will grant you that. It is tedious, but it is thorough. Because when it's all said and done, you have the answer for every member in the truss, which Ultimately, as an engineer, you probably end up needing all those forces anyways because the next task would be, okay, let's say I've got this truss and, I don't know, let's take member CD and let's say member CD has an internal axial force of, I don't know, 500 kips. The next question is, well, how big does member CD need to be in order to safely support that load? 
And as the, uh, the engineer, if your job is to design the truss, you need the forces in every member anyways, right? So the method of joints, while tedious, ends up being what's most commonly utilized. When I teach structural analysis, I have multiple lectures devoted to this because we get really into the, uh, the weeds and the details on this stuff. And I spend way more time on method of joints than I do on the second section or the second method, which is the method of sections. Now, the method of sections does have some advantages, though. Um, whenever you're um, utilizing the method of sections, what you're doing is much more akin to my example of me sitting on the table and you're breaking out the samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan and you're cutting right through, the, uh, uh, through a component of the truss. And the, the, the benefit of that is that by doing the method of sections, you are now dealing with a non-concurrent force system. You're dealing with a rigid body. You're dealing with something like this where the forces don't meet at a common point. So whenever you're utilizing the method of sections, you have a third equation at your disposal. You have the sum of moments, right? So you can solve for more unknowns. But the downside is that it doesn't work really well when you're trying to solve the whole truss. If you're just trying to get force in one member and it's way out in the middle or something, method of sections might make more sense. So <laughs> let's talk about the method of joints. And so that everybody is crystal clear on the structural analysis that we are going to do, and to be frank, what we're going to do in our problems for the rest of the semester, I'm done with 3D. Okay, I'm, I'm done with it. All right. At this point, we need to get to basics and understand the basics of structural analysis. We're not getting into 3D land anymore. It's all going to be 2D. So just, just be aware of that. All right. The method of joints, uh, if you recall, what we're doing is we're investigating each of the joints one by one, and we're applying equations of equilibrium to solve for the uh, internal unknowns. Now, if we're looking in two dimensions and we're looking at the method of joints, I propose we only have two equations of equilibrium at our disposal. We have the sum of forces in the x direction and the sum of forces in the y direction. We do not have sum of moments because this is a concurrent force system. This is a particle statics problem. All the forces all meet at a common point. So whenever we're solving the method of joints, and, and this box right here is probably one of the most important uh, uh, notes on this entire slide, is that whenever you're using the method of joints, we can only solve joints where there are at most two unknowns. So we're going to look at this problem today, and this is going to be the focus of what we look at during this lecture. Um, what we can't do, okay, so, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the problem. So we are going to determine the internal forces of the truss shown using the method of joints, okay? So I've got this truss. It's got a series of members on it, and I've got a roller here, a hinge here, so first thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to determine the support reactions. Okay? That, just point blank. Now, once I determine the support reactions, I then need to start utilizing the method of joints. What I cannot do is begin my analysis by investigating joint B. Okay? Or joint D. Or joint E. Because on those joints, there is more than two unknowns. I mean, we're starting the problem. I don't have a clue what's going on in any of those members, okay? But I could start my analysis at either joint A or joint C because with each of the, these joints, I only have one, two members, one, two members going through the joints in question. So that could be where I start, okay? D does that make sense? And if it doesn't, don't worry, we're going to dig into the details a little bit with this uh, this particular problem. Any questions? All right, let's get into it. Okay. So here's the problem. We're going to determine the internal forces uh, of the plane truss shown using the method of joints. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to compute the support reactions. Now this is looking at the external equilibrium of the structure as a whole. So we've got all three equations of equilibrium. Oops, support reactions. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, I've got this... Um, Reaction here at C, how many reactions do I have at C? Two. 
two. It's a, it's a pin support. We have an X reaction and a Y reaction. How many reactions at E? One, right? So what we'll do is we'll keep it simple. We'll say that this is EY, this is CY, and this is CX, okay? Now, can anybody look at this structure right now and tell me one of them? Just no math. Let's, let's get back into the swing of things. We're solving for support reactions. So we have three equations of equilibrium at our disposal. So can somebody utilize one of these equations real quick to tell me one of the unknowns? CX is zero, CX is zero right? Because if I sum forces in the x direction, there are no horizontally applied loads. So CX is zero. But is everybody okay with this? I feel like everybody's kind of quiet and you're like, if, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. I mean, I, what I don't want is to, for me to just steamroll ahead. Like, we don't even know what you're talking about. Like, please, if you got any questions, let me know. Everybody okay? Okay. So now what we have, so we, so think of this like a, like a, like, you know, the, the cards that we played, we have played this card. We played the sum of the forces in the X direction card. So now we have the sum of the forces in the Y direction and the sum of moments. Um, so let me ask you this. Where would you like me to sum moments? Where would be an easy place to sum moments? I'd probably sum moments at C. Let's sum moments at C. And we're going to take counterclockwise moments positive. Let me scroll down a little bit so I got a little room to write. So we don't have to consider CX. We don't have to consider e or CY. Does EY generate moment? About point C. Yes, it does. Positive or negative moment? Negative, negative moment. How, what's the moment arm from C? Six feet. Do the 1,000 pounds and the 2,000 pounds generate moment at C? Yeah. You bet. Positive or negative moment? Positive. Positive moment. What's the moment arm for the 1,000 pounds? 12 feet. What's the moment arm for the 2,000 pounds? There we go. There we go. Hopefully this is getting you back into the swing of things. So we've got 1,000 times 12, which is 12,000 foot-pounds, plus 24 times 2 is 48, 48,000 foot-pounds. And let's add this over to the other side of the equation. So that equals EY times 6. So 12 plus 48 is 60. Is that fair? We got a positive number, which means our assumption was correct on the direction. We have 10,000 pounds going up. Is that okay? Now, I don't want to steamroll through this. Does, like, I did that kind of quick. Is everybody okay with this? Okay. All right. So, now what do I do to solve for the remaining reaction? Sum of forces in the y direction. And I cheated here, so let me move that down. So if I sum forces in the y direction, so we have CY plus, we'll say EY is 10,000 pounds 
um, minus 2,000, minus 1,000 is zero. So we have 10,000 minus 2 minus 1 is 7. So CY is negative. So let me box these so that we can all kind of see what we're doing here. What I don't want to do is go too fast on this. Is, is everybody okay with this? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is utilize the method of joints. Okay, so let me move this over here. Hold on, I can do better now. Now, let me just go ahead and put all of the, the reactions that we just got. So, EY is 10,000 pounds, and this is downward, and it's 7,000. Okay. No horizontal reaction. Okay. So, the first thing that we need to do is we need to select a joint to begin our analysis. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pick joint C. Could I go ahead and pick joint A? Sure. There's no reason not to, okay? I just picked joint C since we seem to have so much attention to it on before. But it is genuinely a coin flip. It doesn't matter which one you start with, C or A. What you cannot do is start with B, D, or E. There are too many unknowns to deal with because we only have two equations of equilibrium at our disposal when we are using uh, the method of joints because all of the forces in each of those joints all meet at a common point and there is no moment. Does that make sense? By definition. All right. So let's look at joint C. So, hold on, joint C. So what we're doing in joint C is we're treating joint C like a particle statics problem. How did we do particle statics problems? We would draw a free body diagram of the particle, right? And we would list all of the forces that go inside that particle or go through that particle. So here's the particle. And what do we have? We have... 7,000 pounds going through the particle, and I propose that there are two other forces going through the particle, this force and this force. Now, what I'm going to do, and I'm, and I'm going to do this for, the, the, uh, for, the, for this semester so that we're all sort of saying the same thing, is I am going to draw these forces in tension. What do I mean by tension? Okay, This truss is a collection of axially loaded members, which means the force inside the members is along the axis. If you have a column or a member in a truss or what have you, you can either yank on it along its axis, pull it in tension, or you can press on it. You can push it in compression. Okay. I am going to, by default, automatically assume that all of the forces are in tension. Here's the joint and the force is pulling towards the joint, that the truss members are being yanked on. If I do my analysis and I get a negative answer, it does not mean I need to develop significant emotional distress. All it means is that it's the same thing with reactions. I assume it's upward. If I get a negative answer, well, by golly gosh, gee, it's downward. If I assume tension and I get a negative answer, it's compression. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So we'll label these forces. We'll call this, uh-oh, where'd my pen go? I lost my pen. Did anybody happen to see where I put it down? Oh, there it is. That could have been bad. So we'll call this um, force BC, and we'll call this CE, OK? Now, I would like to look at this diagonal a little bit. Hold on. So let's say this is C, this is E. So this dimension here is six feet. This is eight feet. What is this dimension right there? It's 10 feet. There you go. So this is a three, four, five triangle, just augmented a little bit. Okay. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about this angle. Now, what is the measure of that angle? Well, that angle is the inverse tangent of 8 over 6, right? Is that a fair statement? Okay. And I could compute that, and I'd get a number, and then I would ask myself, what is the cosine and sine of that angle? But here's the thing. I propose I can determine the sine and cosine of that angle without ever having to do the trig because I could just say the cosine is what? Um, what's the cosine? Was it 6 over 10? And the sine is what? 8 over 10? Is that a fair statement? What's the tangent? 8 over 6? Is that a fair statement? So what is 8 over 6? I don't know. Uh, uh, 1.33, something like that? So I think my overall point is the trig that we're about to do here in a second, we can probably do by using a little bit of Sakatoa as opposed to um, breaking out you know, some of the complex math. But it doesn't really matter. You do what you want. Now let me explain what we're going to do here. Okay? I'm going to take this system here, and I'm going to break it up into x and y components. Use a lot of that ij notation stuff that we, we haven't looked at for a little while. So I'm going to redraw this. I'm going to say, OK, this is FBC. And for this diagonal, instead of drawing it as a diagonal force, like that. If I wanted to split this up into X and Y components, which way would the X component go? Left. Which way would the Y component go? Go down, right? Is it, are you with me so far? Like, I could take this and say, let's represent it like this and like that. This is F, C, E, X, F, C, E, why? Is that okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. This is important because it makes the solution of the unknowns a lot easier to do. Let me show you how. How many unknowns do I have along the horizontal direction, looking at it this way? Two. How many unknowns do I have along the vertical direction? 
one. Does everybody see that? You follow along with what I'm doing? That these two are unknowns along the horizontal. This is an unknown along the vertical. So let me ask you this. Can anybody tell me what this has to be? 7,000 in which direction? Up. That's exactly right. Because if I sum forces in the y direction, I have 7,000 down, F, C, E, Y. So let's just write it down. So we have negative 7,000 minus F, C, E, Y equals zero. This is negative 7,000. That's going up. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, is, is there a question? This is important. If you're not following along with this, make sure that you're asking, okay, because this is kind of important. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I propose that these two are related to one another, okay? They are related to one another because they both have to correspond to that slope ratio. That whenever I add these two in a tip-to-tail fashion, they have to equal FCE. So one way that we could look at this is we could say, okay, here's FCEY. which I know it's negative, but that's okay. And this is FCEX, that summing those together in a tip-to-tail fashion has to give me FCE, right? Well, we know what's going on with this angle, right? I propose that the tangent of that angle is that over that. Is that a fair statement? What is the tangent of the angle, though? It's 8, 6. Does that make sense? So could I then flip and multiply and say, or, or you know, exchange my, my denominators and say that F C E X is F C E Y over eight six? Is is that fair? Negative 7,000 over 8, 6. What is that? Negative 5250. Do I have a second on that? Okay. If you will bear with me, I would like to now sort of take stock of where I'm at in this problem. So let's, let's sort of redraw the joint. You may not need to do this on your homework or on your calculations that you're looking at in front of you, but you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. Yes, sir? You're, bear with me. You're going to see what I'm going to do with that. Just, you'll see what I mean. I, I'm going to I'm going to account for that here in a second. Okay. But you'll see what I mean. Give, give me a little bit of rope. Okay. All right. Is everybody with me so far on the math? So let me redraw this joint. Let's see if you all can follow along with me on this. Okay. So here's the joint. I've got seven thousand going through the joint. And I have this unknown 
FBC. Now, here's this diagonal, and what did we get for FCEY? We had initially assumed that FCEY was going downward, but when we did the math, we found it was 7,000 going upward. Is everybody okay with that? So, if I were to now represent my joint with what I know now, I need to say that this is 7,000 pounds. Okay? Now, to go to sort of your point, I want to ask maybe you this. What direction does my horizontal force need to be drawn now? It has to go to the right. Because if this was the wrong assumption, that's the wrong assumption too. So, this one... is 5,250 pounds. So, let me ask you this. This diagonal member, is it experiencing tension or compression? Compression. Now, a visual way that you can see that is because both of the loads are pointing towards the joint. The other way is that we assumed tension and we got a negative answer. Now, now I want you to look at this joint now, sort of a, an improved representation of the joint. I want you to ask yourself, what's the FBC? 5250. 5250. And is FBC uh, positive or negative? Like, did we assume correctly or not? Well, hold on. 5250 is going this way. FBC needs to go this way, right? When we initially did our assumption, we assumed that FBC is acting to the left. Is FBC, in fact, acting to the left? Yes, right? Does that make sense? So let's, let's take stock of where we're at. So first off, let's be formal about it. Let's now sum forces in the x direction. So negative FBC plus 52.50 pounds is zero. Five thousand two hundred fifty pounds. And that's positive. In this case, acting to the left. All right. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. So let's take stock of where we're at. First off, do we now have a force system that meets static equilibrium? I got seven thousand down, seven thousand up, five thousand two hundred fifty to the right. 5,250 to the left. Sum of forces in the x direction equals zero. Sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. Boom. My joint meets static equilibrium. With me so far? Now, let's report some meaningful answers from this analysis. All right? FBC is 5,250 pounds. Let me ask you a question. Is, five, is that member FBC? Did we say that was intention or compression? tension because it's yanking away from the joint. So typically the way that we'll do that is we'll say that member FBC is 5,250 pounds and it is in tension. Now, what about the force in this diagonal member? How would we determine the magnitude of that force? We have an X component of 5,250 and a Y component of 7,000. What is the resultant? How do we determine the resultant? Boom, the Pythagorean theorem. So FCE is squared plus squared. And what do we get? Say it again. 87.50. Do I have a second on that? Now, what direction is this? Is this tension or compression? Compression. Okay. Now we're rocking and rolling. So I propose that this right here, this is the fruit of our joint analysis. We had a joint that had two unknowns. The force in this member and the force in this member 
and we were able to solve it out. Now, to be crystal clear, I did this problem in a pretty long fashion because I, I was really trying to explain the answer. As you progress throughout method of joints, you'll be able to do these a lot faster. Let me explain. Okay, I'd like to go back to my truss here and I want to illustrate something. So here is the truss and we now know two of the members. We know this and we know this. Is that correct? We, we, that's what we just did, right? We solved for the internal forces inside member BC and member CE. So now, could we go ahead and attack joint E? Right, we know, how many members are going through joint E? Three, but we know one of them. We just solved it. So we could go ahead and attack joint E. Let's do that, let's see what happens. Now remember, joint E has a 10,000 pound load acting vertically. Now, you got to pay attention to this. This is kind of important. This is, this is probably the one thing that will trip you up on the homework assignment and on truss analysis in general. So here's the truss. This is 10,000 pounds. Now I'd like to look at joint E. Okay. Now that I think you understand the process, maybe we can do the joint analysis a little faster. Okay, so let's look at joint E. Are there any loads applied directly to joint E? The answer is yes, okay? The answer is we have 10,000 pounds. Now, We have three members. Okay? Now watch what I'm going to do. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to, and, and I'm just using a little color coordination. You don't have to do this on your homework assignment. But I'm going to put blue tick marks next to the ones that are unknowns. And notice how here... See how I'm doing this as a, a, a diagonal, how I'm splitting it up into X and Y co uh, components already? For the other diagonal, though, I know those components, right? This was 7,000. This was 5,250. Is, is that correct? Now, I want everybody to get to this point because I really want you to pay attention to this. This is kind of important. All right, everybody watch up here. Here's a marker. I'm going to take this marker and stick it between my hands, and I'm going to apply compression to it. So I'm going to take it, and I'm going to push it together. This hand is pushing that way, right? This hand is pushing that way. So my hands are pushing in equal and opposite directions. The, hold on, did I lose my marker again? Please tell me I didn't. I put it over here again. I put it over here again. Okay. I propose that the arrow direction for these two forces need to be like that. Now, how did I come up with that? There are two ways of thinking about it. Here's the first. Member CE was in compression, right? Member CE is in compression, so these two forces have to push towards the joint, okay, for it to be in compression. That's one way of thinking about it. Here's the other way of thinking about it. Equal and opposite. Here, we got the 7,000 pounds was up. Here, the 7,000 pounds needs to be down. Here, uh, 5,250 pounds acting to the right. 5,250 pounds acting to the left. And how am I getting that? Again, marker, compression, pushing on the marker. My hands are pushing equal force, opposite directions. Does that make sense? Okay, 
Now let's see if we can do a little bit of mental math here. Let's see if we can pay attention to, to what's going on here. All right. So, how many unknowns, how many blue tick marks, how many unknowns do I have in the horizontal direction? Two. How many unknowns do I have in the vertical direction? One. So, let's look at the vertical direction first. I've got 10,000 pounds going up and I got 7,000 pounds going down. What does that vertical component need to be? 3,000 down. It's got to be 3,000 down because the sum of the forces needs to be zero. Does that make sense? Okay. If that's 7,000, how do you think I'm going to determine the horizontal component? What? Oh, I put 3,000. I'm sorry. 3,000. Did I say? I'm sorry about that. It's supposed to be 3,000. My sincere apologies. If this is 10,000 going up and that's 7,000 going down, that needs to be 3,000 going down. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I've got this component, how do you think I'm going to determine the other component? How do you think I'm going to do that? Well, doesn't the tangent of that angle equal 3,000 divided by whatever fx is, right? And isn't this member also 6 units over, 8 units up? So this isn't this 8 over 6 equals 3,000 divided by fx? What is that? Twenty two fifty. Do I have a second on that? Do I have a second? Everybody, I mean, okay, there we go. Now, notice how I drew it just acting to the right. Why did I draw it acting to the right? Well, that component is pointing towards the joint, so that component needs to point towards the joint. D does that make sense? So if that makes sense, how are we going to determine this one right here? Well, there we go. We got 2250 this way, 5250 this way. What do we need? What's the difference? 3000 acting in which direction? To the right. Boom. I know the first joint took a while because we needed to explain it. Now the second joint, you're doing it kind of quickly. You see how the process works? So now, if we go back to our truss, now we've got this member, this member, this member, and this member solved, right? So see how now we can say, okay, now we can do joint D. We just do the same thing. We do joint B, do the same thing. Do joint A, boom. We just keep going until the truss is done, right? Normally what happens is your very last joint, you only have one member to solve, and then it's done. So typically what you'll do is whenever you're done, you will report your final answer as something like this. You'll say like, okay, this is, I don't know, 87.50 in compression. Then you'll say like this one is 52.50 in tension. And you just write out your answers and boom, there's your trust solution, done. That's the method of joints. Does that make sense? That's the method of joints in a nutshell. What you then do as an engineer, and maybe we'll talk about this in Engineering 216 if you're taking this next semester, is how do we size these elements to safely resist those loads? We'll talk in 216 how axial forces change. Their dip you handle those differently than you do bending moments, how um, 
tension members are handled a little differently than compression members because compression members buckle, etc. That's how you do method of joints. You've got a homework assignment on it. Hopefully that goes well. Let me know if you have any questions on teams. That's all I've got. I will see you all on Friday.